let me know if you can't if it doesn't work Hello, my name is Kaede Furuta. I'm an ordinary university student. I'm from Aichi Prefecture. Today, I'm going to talk about what I especially do for the environment. My first topic is recycling. I work on recycling in a proactive way. I separate recyclable garbage into categories. And also, I sometimes go to a second-hand store to sell clothes, which I don't wear anymore. The next topic is cycling. I like cycling. When I go to a nearby shop, um, I try not to use my car. I reduce CO2 emissions by riding a bicycle. And finally, I feel fears about the future because cases of abnormal climate are becoming more frequent. That's all. Thank you. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's Kaide. And next is going to be Takumi. Hello, my name is Takumi Kozuka from Gifu Shoto Gakken University. There are many environment issues that concern me, but today I want to discuss the plastic issue. Plastic, which is easy to use, is used in all aspects of our lives and is indispensable to our livelihoods. However, while it is convenient, the plastic problem is now becoming a serious issue around the world. I want to focus on the plastic bottle garbage problem. Nowadays, anyone can buy drinks in plastic bottles at supermarkets and convenience stores easily. However, the trash from those pet bottles is being thrown away all over the city, polluting the environment of towns, rivers, and oceans. And it is the cause of environment pollution. Mm -hmm. For example, you know that some marine creatures have mistaken floating plastic garbage for food and swallowed it. So it's not only about polluting the environment, but also about affecting money life and the lives of human beings like us. By eating fish and birds that have taken plastic into their bodies, there is danger that plastic will accumulate in our bodies, our bodies, uh, even navigate. Therefore, I have been using special bottle. Since I was in senior high school, by using this bottle, I have been able to save money protect the environment and animals, and drink preservative free water every day. I believe that this problem should be solved by us, all working together to protect the environment and living things. I would be happy if many people try the same solution after listening to my talk today. That's all. Thank you. Okay, right. That's it. All right. Round of applause for the students. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. Okay, so now we've got um, a free for all. Anybody can, we've got uh, 
20 minutes before Kerry starts her presentation. So it's a sort of get to know, get to know each other and talk about the students' presentations. Back to you, Glenn. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> I know, I know the feeling. Um, okay, so um, if I, I can start then, um, there was something actually that when the students are talking reminded me of something that I read earlier today and um, it was on, if, I'm going to share the link with you, but the, the main idea was uh, from EFL Footprint as I'm reading today and um, there's this wonderful quote on there, which is quite long, but you can read it afterwards. But the basic idea is that there are many issues uh, in the world. And one of the things that often holds students back from engaging with environmental issues is perhaps it's seeming too big uh, for them and then feeling powerless to affect any change um, and not seeing their actions as being good enough. Um, when they're not, they may be doing one thing, for example, cycling to university instead of driving or recycling plastic or using bottles instead of plastic bottles, using glass bottles, um, but not doing other areas and feeling that small scale um, contributions to the environment are not good enough. And um, this wonderful quote on um, EFL, sorry, ELT footprint. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I'll read just a little bit and we can share the link. It begins, it's from Carla Borthwick, inspired by Peter, Peter Kelly's book, Earth is Hiring. And it reads, to the person who uses metal straws to save fish but consumes animals, I'd like to say thank you. To the vegan who isn't aware of a homeless problem, thank you. And it continues with many other examples. So listening to the um, presentations, it reminded me of that and something also this year that I put into classroom. But maybe other people here tonight can share um, their uh, ideas about that point. You know, what was the point at which you, thank you very much, Gary, um, for putting the link into chat. What was the point at which you, could change that feeling because I think it's something we all go through, isn't it? That environmental issues are so huge. Where do we start? It's all hopeless. What's the point? But there is a point that we come across that we do change our opinion. And maybe uh, some some of you would like to share um, something. Can I share something yeah. that just popped up? Yeah. Um, I used to always complain about waribashi, the chopsticks that you throw away. And then one day I went to some conference and I saw a Japanese woman there and she just had her own chopstick and I had never thought of it. I was always very critical, but I still use them. And then I thought, oh, oh, that's easy. <laughs> and so it was, you know, I mean, lots of small steps, but that was one. Mm. It was just, oh yes, you can do something. Mm. And I, I must say, when I used to go in, initially go into shops with my own chopsticks, I would feel a little nervous and, you know, who's watching me? And then you just get used to it. And it's the same with the plastic bottles, I think, and everything. Mm. That's me. <laughs> And that, that's a good point. And good point, Kerry. Um, Kerry just pointed out in chat, it's kind of cycl cyclical. We do forget. We lapse. Uh, Can I add something? Sure, yeah, okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, I, I think that the, the term that's being used popularly in the psychology community is eco-anxiety. Um, that feeling of, you know, fear, guilt, helplessness, uh, my, my children are going to have a terrible world, I'm not doing enough, and the ways about how to address it have trans transitioned a bit from psychology to education, mm. because it's quite a real feeling, and, you know, we have students that'll be grappling with these feelings as well as, as us, and I think that that poem on that, that you read a little piece of um, can help, as, as Carrie said, to inspire a little bit of joy, like, if, even if you 
do the tiniest part, that one cycling to your job and cycling home, it, it should make you feel good to do that and no. not, you know, you shouldn't drown in the helplessness. And our students sometimes experience that. Thank you. So, thank you. Would anyone else like to add anything, Brent? Oh yeah, I was listening. I was I caught up with the climate um, thing that I I've been listening to since August. I got a bit behind. Sorry, Kerry, with the the British Council Climate Podcast. And one of the um, teachers on today said, "If you don't have cl climate anxiety, you should be worried." Hmm. So it's it's in a way it's not it's nothing to really worry about. It's take it in your stride and don't worry about it too much but it's the people who don't who aren't concerned that are the problem mm -hmm. so as long as you're doing try to do your best i make so many mistakes every day mm -hmm. but as long as you try to do your best that that's it this is as good as you can do sort of thing but it's the people who don't do anything that, that they may have a uh, convincing them it may be our next target if that makes sense Oh, yeah, perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Because one of the other things is, um, uh, I, I don't know whether we're going to hear much tonight. Um, we're talking about environment. One of the things that I've seen a lot in Japan is um, talk of sustainable development goals and linking those to, it seems, um, organization or uh, universities and even down to um, courses are now being aligned with certain goals. One, education is, of course, one of the themes of all the goals. Um, and I, I wondered how that really grabs people's attention. I found this year I've taught a course based on the sustainable development goals. And what I found during the course was that focusing on local activities or local solutions that people were doing as individual small scale uh, things that communities or individuals were doing um, really was inspiring for students to read about and cause them to think that, oh, there are alternatives. And um, I, I, it made me wonder at the end of the year, because I kind of stepped back from whenever I've seen sustainable development goals, it's all, there's a lot and it doesn't make sense to me. And maybe that's a generational thing for me as well, um, that I, it hasn't been part of my education to date. So where do you start? So if anyone has any recommendations, where would you recommend students to start with this engaging with environmental issues when learning English. Can I, can I just say that I, I second your feeling about the SDGs. I teach a university in Japan and they're everywhere and you just, you can't get away from them. So as a, as a framework of understanding, it's just, oh, they're, they're really useful, but can I, can we stop for a minute? Can we stop numbering them? I, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, just sharing, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think, I think, saw... right. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that here in Granada, I mean, I'm one of those people because, you know, I've always taught in the classroom, um, never really got out there and done much, to be honest, environmental work until the last couple of years. And we got in contact with Operación Encina, which in English is like the oak operation. And I, I know nothing about planting. Absolutely. I'm the worst planter in the world. You know, I couldn't even, I don't know, the simplest plants I couldn't grow. So anyway, I went up there one day into the, into the mountain here in Granada. And um, I was given a bit of a chat and, and I spoke to Beatriz, who's here today as well. And from the, it just takes one small thing, got up there. And now it's just like an addiction. It's like a part of my life. It's completely changed everything. So I think like what we were talking about before with, you know, chopsticks and things like that, it only takes one small thing, I think, and a little nudge for people to look around. I think people don't really know what to do in, in terms of well, how I want to participate, but I don't know how that that's what I see. The, yeah. What we were talking about before and just one little thing changes everything. Hi. Okay, Bob. Yeah, one idea that uh, popped into my head then, um, 
This isn't directly concerned with the environment, but it could be adapted for the environment. Something I did with uh, my classes this time was um, 30 day challenge. I showed in the 30 day challenge um, video on TED Talks and uh, they had to go away and think of something they could do as a 30 day challenge. I wasn't thinking specifically the environment, but things like say, uh, going to bed earlier and getting up earlier, mm -hmm. reading something every day and things like that. But you could maybe uh, think of some environmental issues and make a 30 day challenge built around them and then get the students to report about it um, face to face if you can, or if not, uh, if you're online via Flipgrid or something like that. Mm. So that's just one suggestion. Mm. Mm. There was a thing I think in the UK where students could get um, a bag of seeds from somewhere and they were asked to oh. throw these on any piece of waste ground to, uh, uh, to uh, encourage the bee population. Mm. Which of course is one of the other issues in the environments. And guerrilla gardening is um, is quite a thing in Japan, I understand as well. No, the planting of flowering plants, particularly in you know sort of in ugly urban areas, just to beautify even. But then obviously with the you know <clears throat> the added advantage of encouraging the bee community, but also just that idea of letting nature back into our urban environments mm. and, and mm. Um, little actions like that that can feel like rebellion can be very empowering, motivating, mm. I think. Mm. But uh, going back to the SDGs, um, I was talking to a university teacher uh, recently who she had done a project with her, they were actually trainee teachers um, and they went through which what they did was she just showed them the SDG poster mm. and each group had to choose one and just consider um, what it might mean to them as teachers in the classroom and they had to create a, a, a very short two minute video um, representing visually that particular SDG and it was just a very quick way in for them to be aware of them and to actually um, I don't know, get hands on and creative with them, uh, own them a little bit more. And I thought that was a really nice way to seed uh, this idea amongst trainee teachers so that when they're going into the classroom, they will already have this as a, a foundation. So then like, you know, you and me that we weren't brought up with that as the foundation of our own education. So we're, we're learning it as we go along. But um, right. I thought it was a great start for these trainee teachers. Excellent. And I just see Namiko has her hand up. Do you have a question or something to add, Namiko? Um, yeah, like two perspectives. I think from the teacher's perspective, I definitely recommend um, attending these uh, like organizations where they there are like active social uh, or social activists um, because the the passion is there and you actually understand. Um, really that it's kind of like beyond the SDGs, that it really is a way of living. Um, mm -hmm. And when you do go to these sessions, I, I just uh, went to one these past two years and these, these are youth. So these are youth who are taking, uh, um, taking back the power that maybe uh, adults have taken away from them and they're doing whatever they can with the knowledge and know-how. And these are 30 and below. Um, and so for me, when I'm attending these sessions with youth, I feel very optimistic because if they're optimistic, because it's their future, right? Mm -hmm. um, then I, you know, I feel like, okay, then what can I do? What can I do to propel them to do even more then? Um, and then for us, especially being here in Japan, I think there's a disconnect because we are a developed uh, nation. And so I think we do need to have or we need to be more in touch with other countries that may not be as um, privileged as we are. And, and our students also need to engage with the students. And actually we are. So I can tell you um, from experience that um, it is an eye opener for all of us who are involved in projects like that as well. Thank you. Okay, um, 
um, sorry, I'm going to get this wrong. Is Milika, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Morning. Uh, first, it's, I, I want, as you said, educate you. So uh, nothing bad, of course. It's Milica, like pizza. Okay. So think about pizza. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I love that analogy. Well, I, I'm wondering uh, how early is it here in Europe? It's, it's 930. Is it early to say something radical? I don't know, because I feel like we are stepping in circles and we're like uh, trying to be very politically correct. Uh, I'm not going to talk about politics, of course, as I said, mine are very radical, but I want to be radical about uh, this topic. Uh, as a preschool teacher, sustainable development goals are absolutely out of the window. Uh, we should not be teaching kids about the issues, uh, and I absolutely focus on instilling the love towards nature. So the philosophy, especially in all of my papers, and I keep talking, repeating myself, is that we are teaching about environment without saying anything about the environment. So before going to issues, uh, let's make kids uh, explore sensory, take them outside as much as you can. Again, from a perspective of a preschool teacher who also teaches English, uh, environmental issues uh, can be very damaging to a psyche of a six-year-old, which is one year before elementary school. Uh, I have seen children cry when they understand that things do not dissolve in water. So uh, we are talking about uh, absolutely different concepts of introducing environment with the little ones and a high, uh, high school education, for example, or university. So I would definitely uh, want to get this out there. Uh, don't focus on the issues, focus on the love for the nature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I know it's a little, it sounds, I don't know, it sounds a little bit spiritual, but take the kids outside, let them touch the trees. Thank you. <laughs> this doesn't mean, I'm sorry, this doesn't mean the environmental sustainability goals are bad. Absolutely not. But there's a time and place for them. Um, they've become as, as uh, maybe a brand in the late, 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 well, I don't know, maybe the last 10 years. As, as Kate said, it's like poster posters. So um, I don't want posters. I want leaves. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was passionate. Uh, that's just what I, how I believe we should try to shift towards it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Thank you. And um, okay, one last one from Beatrice. Yeah, so I just want to say that um, actually what we do is to take everything into actions. So we acknowledge that there is this problem. We already designed our school program based on our results, in our reforestation results. And what we did is just doing it. I mean, like uh, we set up, um, let's say like our, our system of working where we use recycled plastic. We do everything by our own. And then when we realize that actually we had a system that work, we implemented into school because I'm also an English teacher. And therefore um, I normally do it in Spanish, but uh, with uh, Graham, we implemented in English as well. And we translated because we can't do it in any, any language actually. Uh, we get them engaged. We don't speak about the problems only a little bit, but we speak about the solutions because I think it's, yeah. it's time now that we start taking action. It's been too long that we haven't done anything. Uh, mostly we complain behind a screen <laughs> on our phones. Uh, we don't do anything really. And to be honest, Operación Encino, um, the Oak Operation, is a lifestyle. We work the whole year round. Every week, we only ask for maybe a, two hours per week, no more, or even less. But it's a um, program where we actually do something and there is a continuation the whole year round. Because to be honest, when I'm going to put an example, if you're studying English, you don't do it one day, no? Exactly. For example. So I think we, we really need to have continuity. And it's only about time that um, if we don't do it now, we're going to regret it. OK, thank you. <laughs> I, I think you, what you've just said, I, I can see Milika's uh, clapping and nodding. And it's very compatible, positive solutions. And you know, giving students yes, something to inspire and make them active. So uh, we've come to 5.30 now, and we're going to um, move on to the next part of our program, 
which is um, to hear about uh, ELT footprint from uh, Kerry. And so, what do I do next? Brent, you're going. <laughs> Brent, are you I'm, 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 yes, I'm, I'm just hand over to her, I think would be better. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Kerry, who's going to talk for the next hour. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, like, lovely. So um, what I'm going to do um, really is kind of talk you through the background to the to ELT footprint, the organization, what goes on, how it came about and everything. But please just butt in at any point if you have a question or um, sometimes I have problems whilst actually looking at my presentation also seeing the chat so if i'm ignoring stuff that's going on in the chat please just shout out and let me know okay so my chat box is actually open at the moment and i should be fine but sometimes it disappears so okay uh, so the elt footprint um community we'll, we've already heard um from glenn from he quoted on our about page the um poem by carla borthwick which uh, we'll come around to again, but it's very much the ethos of the community is to be supportive. Um, and uh, we're going to come into this in a lot more detail as we go through. So, but I'm going to ask you to bear with me. We're going to go on a very um, short uh, historic journey, very short, because our community was set up in 2019. So there's not a lot of history to tell, but uh, it was set up in a very different world. Um, so let's just have a look back. First of all, <clears throat> a little um, ELT uh, activity for you, the infamous gap fills. Can you fill the gaps here? Considering the picture. Uh, this, is, this was a mantra of hikers in the States in the 1920s. It started off as um, uh, a hiking community and this was their slogan. Um, okay, so pictures, um, it was earlier than that really. I don't think they had cameras with them all the time. Yeah, so Kate has got take only memories. Yeah, take only memories and leave only obviously footprints okay so and the footprints here are in the sand so they're very easily erased and um, don't cause any damage so uh, the part this was kind of partly there when we chose the ELT footprint as uh, the name for the community just this idea of um, awareness of ourselves and um, of the effect we can have uh, both positive and negative okay so um, we came on to this is our ELT footprint slogan, the green footprint. Um, and um, I looked up the word footprint um, to look for the most common collocations in the Oxford Dictionary. Okay. And um, what do you think might have been the most common collocations for the word footprint? In the dictionary, this is like in a printed dictionary. Any ideas in the chat box? In the sand, heavy, digital, that's definitely um, a current one. Okay, so actually, um, in the dictionary, the number one collocation was um, fresh fresh footprints so that one ties in with a detective that someone had there in the chat box then there was muddy muddy footprints so if any of you have got uh, little kids or dogs and um, you know you'll you'll know about muddy footprints wet footprints was another one as well but in the dictionary they didn't have carbon they didn't have carbon footprint which was just showing that you know sort of Sometimes the materials we work with, even dictionaries, are slightly out of date. Um, 
I looked up on Google uh, Ngram, which is a favorite tool of mine, uh, to see whether Muddy Footprint, which was the number one collocation, um, how it competed with carbon footprints and look what happened since uh, 2002. So it's not that far, it's not that long, you know, the carbon footprint as a, as a term, it's only been around since the year 2000. So um, this awareness has been around for much longer. Environmentalists have been talking about this problem for decades, for at least 50, 60 years, but as a term, as a linguistic term, so because the language teachers were interested in the linguistic terms, uh, carbon footprint is only 20 years old, but now obviously is has far, far um, past the, the muddy footprint stage. Okay, so going back again to 2019, and this is the background to when the community came together, and I think um, there was a real uh, mass consciousness that was growing in that year in particular across the globe, but uh, going back to the Oxford Dictionary, um, and every year they uh, choose the most frequently used word of the year, which is often a new term. So I'm sure you can guess what the word of the year was in 2019. In fact, it's, it's cheating because it's a it's not a word as such, it's an item. So it's actually a, a multi-word item. <laughs> and if you could, if you want to type that in the chat box, what your guess might be. Okay, here we go. Climate emergency. So the year 2019 was the year of um, coining climate emergency as opposed to um, before people were talking about climate change, but climate change was a very toothless term, as it were. Um, change, change can be good, you know, what is climate change? So the, the idea of using the term climate emergency was something that was at the top of discourse in the year 2019. And in fact, in that year, the top 10 words were all to do with the climate there was this kind of semantic field and that had never happened before, that the most frequent words were all talking about the same issue. Obviously, 2020 came along and the word of the year for 2020 was very different. Um, and um, I think well, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit uh, in a moment too. But anyway, uh, here is a quote, for example, of how climate emergency was used. And this idea of climate emergency being the defining issue of our time, and it is still, and even though there are distractions, <laughs> um, to give it a very euphemistic term, um, we're very well aware that this is the issue of our time. Uh, so on this backdrop of this idea of the climate emergency, um, being announced as well in 2019 was the first time that um, nations and states started to announce a climate emergency. And um, so I think, in fact, Scotland was the very first, um, I'm going to call Scotland a nation, rather than not a state, but a nation to declare the climate emergency. There were also places like California, who were declaring climate uh, climate emergency, but in this year, Spain also declared a climate emergency, and it's like, well, so what does this mean? Is it just words? Well, um, to some extent, it is just words because the UK government also announced a climate emergency, and then you look at the laws which are being passed with uh, the uh, taking climate emergency um, as their starting point. A lot of them are actually not fulfilling the promise. But uh, as uh, Melissa said, um, I'm not going to be political. I'm going to move on from that point. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but another thing that was happening at the time, which was quite interesting. So the Guardian um, newspaper, the UK newspaper, uh, started their campaign to inform about the climate emergency. And one of the things that they did was to talk about language and the language that we use to talk about the climate 
And one of these terms that was changing was they made a decision that across their reporting, they were not going to talk about climate change anymore. They were gonna talk about climate crisis, climate emergency. Um, they weren't going to talk about global warming. They were gonna talk about global heating because warming sounded like it could be positive. So there's this um, style guide from The Guardian, which is quite an interesting point to, a starting point to think about the way that we talk um, about the climate and how language can actually have a very powerful effect and how um, journalists, for example, have that is a big move that they can make is to shift the language that they use. But as teachers as well, I think we can shift the language that we teach um, simply using the terms, not so, so kind of creating a new vocabulary, as it were, or updating our vocabulary. Um, so, coming to <clears throat> the Climate Emergency Declaration for the ELT industry, which was the flashpoint um, to uh, the, the foundation of the ELT footprint community. So, um, this was on the 24th of May, as you can see on the screen. And uh, Daniel Barber, who is um, <clears throat> a teacher, uh, a trainer, a materials writer, um, he was at a conference in Barcelona and at the in the closing plenary, he made an, a climate emergency declaration for the ELT industry. And he quoted the Carla Borthwick poem um, during that plenary. <clears throat> so it's a quite a small conference, I would say 150 attendees maybe, but it has quite a large online following with um, reports on Twitter and um, this kind of sparked, I don't know how many different conversations all over all over the world in staff rooms and everybody saying, oh my goodness, we've been doing this already. We've been talking about it. We've been trying to find a way to uh, network with other teachers. It's so good to hear that other people are thinking in the same way. And um, it became obvious that, <clears throat> in fact, one of the things that Daniel Barber called for in his plenary was um, to create some kind of a community. So it became obvious that what we needed was a space somewhere where we would be able to continue these conversations but have them linked so rather than lots of scattered cells we could create some kind of an organism um, and at the time and i think still uh, facebook was the logical place to meet because um, a lot of people already had facebook accounts but it's a private group uh, it's possible for you to create a Facebook account and only join ELT Footprint if, uh, or you can follow ELT Footprint on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, through the website. It doesn't have to be through Facebook because I know that there are legitimate um, complaints and worries about Facebook too, but this, is, <clears throat> this was the medium that was chosen. And so um, we kicked off the uh, community and within a week we had 300 members and we thought oh this is wonderful but actually um i think it was glenn again who mentioned um we now have 3900 almost 4000 members from um over 120 countries um all the continents and and so it was clear that this was something that really um, inspired a lot of people and that it was needed, it was necessary. So, um, so the, the initial community of 300 has spread to be this much, much wider community now. Okay, so um, going back to, uh, well, or coming forward to now, and um, I'm sure you'll have seen this cartoon of the tidal waves. So, this is the situation we're in, you know, sort of climate change is there, it's the biggest one, but there are distractions. And uh, sometimes it's difficult for people to focus on um, the continuing need to be <clears throat> working in wh wh whatever way, whether it's creating hope and empathy and love for nature with preschoolers, um, bolstering them so that they don't suffer from eco-anxiety so that they become um, activists, not passive uh, receptors of, of this doom. So, um, but it, there are other things that have got in the way. Uh, but I think that <clears throat> looking back over the 
global pandemic so far, um, we have learned lessons which also help us in uh, fighting the climate emergency. And, um, and these lessons can be very little ones, um, such as, I don't know, I, I really noticed in the town that I live in, which is a coastal town, um, and we, we had a pretty severe lockdown in Spain for the first two months, which meant that we weren't allowed to leave our homes and um, um, children under 18s weren't even allowed to go out to do the essential stuff like shopping or whatever. So they were stuck in their homes for two months. And then when we were allowed out for the first time, um, everybody started just going for walks and the beach became like this communal space that before it had been ignored in the winter and now and it's continued <clears throat> people prefer to go for a walk than to sit inside and i think that's a great lesson excuse me <clears throat> okay <laughs> it's a great lesson to learn and not only that but they respect the beach because it became their salvation so um a couple of weeks ago the kids had had like a huge party on the beach the night before and um it was one of those kind of we again been released from the omicron wave and they were being allowed out to party they left the beach in such a mess but within an hour just local people the, the, those of us who were just walking on the beach with our dogs the mess had been cleared up it took an hour and everybody just deciding this is our communal space this is our responsibility together and it, and it all disappeared so there was the negative of um possibly this kind of release from the pressure of the lockdown but also that there was this collective responsibility that's grown that really i don't think i would have seen three or four years ago so there's good and bad and lessons we've learned and that's just one tiny example i'm sure you can all think of examples of things that we've learned about how to travel less, how to um, use online resources in an effective way in order to limit the amount of traffic, for example, um, needless journeys, etc. Of course, there's lots of negative lessons too, but I'm not going to dwell on that right now. So I'd like to move on to this idea, which was another thing that um, inspired um, the community. And um, it's an interesting video to watch. It's very short, but Will Grant is an Australian um, lecturer in um, environmental studies and an activist. And he um, has this idea of the four levels of activism. And um, he talks about the first level um, being our individual actions, and I, I can't remember who was who mentioned this earlier, but it, it's I, it was one of the students. I think the first student who spoke about um, individual actions and how important they were for her. And I think that our individual actions are important, um, not only of themselves, but because they fit into into a bigger picture. So individual actions like using your own chopsticks. Um, my equivalent of that is um, taking my own straw. Uh, one Christmas, everybody's Christmas present was um, a little velvet envelope with um, metal straws that they could, that could be washed and reused. Um, so this is just a small individual action, you might think, but there is the idea that if everybody's doing it, then it then multiplied by millions, it becomes an important action. But that's the first level, uh, level one. Level two is, I guess, um, my kind of slightly manipulative Christmas present uh, is that what you influence your friends, you influence your families, not that you preach at them, but that they see you as an example. So they see your actions, they learn from your actions. Um, there are things that we learn from each other. Um, for example, I'm a massive fan of, this is such a tiny individual action as well, uh, beeswax wraps. When I first, then, and I came late to beeswax wraps, but it was like I was, I, when my kids were little, we were trying to eliminate all of the extra plastic and foil that's created by 
the kids taking their snacks to school and you know sort of so it was easy enough um no no juice cartons no plastic straws no plastic bottles and then it was what shall i wrap the sandwiches in well we can use paper it's better than plastic but then i came across the beeswax wraps and that was you know sort of my um i i started <clears throat> enthusing to all my friends and everybody's kids and then uh, suddenly everybody was using this for their uh, sandwiches for school at mid in mid morning so the second level is um how our actions can influence our immediate um in circle our social circle as it were our friends and our family but the third level is where we have the most influence especially as educators is our professional level of influence um, and so the contacts that we have at work and we have to think about how wide our network actually is and it's much wider than we think so um, the example that will gives in the video is of um, being able to uh, persuade a school to take on solar panels in order to become um, uh, autonomous and use renewable energy and um, he was able to do that because of his influence because of the people that he knew um, at the level of decision making um, but I think also there's this idea of the whole school approach that I think um, Bea uh, was talking about as well was this idea of throughout your institution you can have an influence as one teacher you can influence the whole of your institution and you can change the culture within that institution and that's where our influence is most powerful and that is where we can make the biggest change level four change which is he he has the four levels is a macro level of um lobbying uh, politicians, lobbying governments, so protesting, getting out on the street, and that's also very important. He doesn't say that any, any of these levels are more important than the others, that he just, we have to be active on all levels, but the level where we have the most influence, where we can make the most difference, is this third level, where we use our network of influences to, to create change. And so to think about who do I know? Who can I talk to? How can I do this? Um, an example, maybe another example is that as a materials writer, again, this was happening in 2019, um, another member of the LT Footprint community, before the community even existed, um, Catherine Billsborough, the two of us were um, getting other writers who were writing for the same publishers to sign an open letter to send to the publishers asking them um, if what they were doing about the environment what, if they were reviewing their um their policies for things like use of paper use of plastic um printing and transport and this ridiculous idea that a book um is is printed in China then has to be transported back to the UK to then be distributed in China again, which was, you know, sort of the carbon footprint of that transport is just crazy. Um, so the idea of local printing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And we had um, mixed reactions. Some of the publishers were amazingly responsive and came back straight away and said there are people who are working and are making change again. Uh, we don't see it because it's happening at level three. It's happening within the organization. So one of the nice things that I think the good things, the positive things that's happening in the LT uh, Footprints community is that these changes are being broadcast. They're being shared. And so then action inspires action. And you see, oh, hey, how did you do that? I'd love to do the same. Yeah, okay, my position is similar. Let's talk about it. And so basically the idea of the community is this of sharing the projects that are going on and connecting with people who'd like to do the same, giving support, giving encouragement, giving help, but also kind of inspiring, giving a spark as well. So um, anyway, this I 
I don't know um, if you'll be able to grab this link, it, but I think if you just look for, oh, it's a Pachamama, it's on the Pachamama website. So if you Google Will Grant or uh, Four Levels of Activism and Pachamama, you'll find it. Okay. So, sorry, my chat box is in the way. So we have my professional sphere being the most important and that's where the ELT footprint came about. That's where it's placed at this third level of influence. Okay, and this is our mission statement on the footprint page. So if you want to have a quick read of that. So this basically is, um, what I've been talking about, the ethos of the community. So it's a really, really supportive community. And I did a quick poll. It was a poll of um, very few people really um, who answered, but I think it was quite representative that the majority of members are teachers. Um, and, and then we have a spread of lots of different roles as well. It's not only teachers, but it's predominantly teachers and people who are supporting teachers, but it's teaching and teachers, which is at the heart of the community. Okay, so this is what we do. And this is what we don't do. Okay, so it's, it's not a political um, with a capital P organization, um, the fourth level, we, we share our experiences of um, protesting, of being part of associations, but that's not what we're about. If you want to, uh, I think if, if you want to know about the level four, it's far more effective to become um, a member of one of the ecological lobbying organizations, whether that's um, whatever, whatever is, is strongest in your particular area. Um, but in ELT Footprint, we try to do all of the positive and uh, we do not shame. We try to keep to the ethos of the Carla Borthwick poem of celebrating all of the good actions. Okay, so um, this is our website with, and blog on the website. And um, I'll share the link with you in, in a moment, um, but it, it, it's simply eltfootprint.org. And um, this is kind of our static heart, as it were. This is where we, we publish blog posts, but also we store materials and lesson plans and useful links and references and so on. Okay, so here um, are some, some examples. We had a series called Greening ELT, which um, covered a lot of different topics. Uh, that series at the moment is, is on hold because a lot of it was about live events, but hopefully we'll be coming back to that. Um, so the, we share um, information about, for example, training courses for um, writing materials. Um, the, here, this was a carbon offset program um, so a guide to carbon offset and the pitfalls also, um, and kind of it, the, this whole discourse on um, greenwashing. Um, people ask questions and uh, get answers very quickly. So uh, this was a question about um, uh, eco frameworks and this conversation was a couple of years ago and we are now actually working on creating eco frameworks for ELT so the question has become action. Um, so here uh, we have our materials tab which is probably the most popular part of the website where materials are classified under various different topics. Um, so you can click on the tab, you can go in and you can see ideas that have been contributed by members of the community. Sometimes they are links to lesson material that already existed online, but they have been vetted in the sense that they've been recommended by a member of the community. So uh, you know that someone 
has looked at the lesson plan and said this works, this is good, this is worth using, um, often with notes of how people have used it. But also there are lesson plans that have been contributed by members of the community. Okay, so um, here's an example, festival footprints. So this was, uh, again, uh, it's, this particular lesson is in the days when um, tens of thousands of people could go to a festival. And, uh, and, but we're coming back to that again. Hopefully the world will be back to festivals. And uh, this is a really interesting um, take on festivals and footprints and festivals that don't leave any footprints at all. It's a buy nothing day, another um, very popular, uh, you know, sort of special day lesson so uh, Black Friday or buy nothing day and buy nothing day is becoming more and more popular um, fashion footprint and in this case um, this started from a conversation someone shared a resource uh, on the community and then Sue Kay a materials writer you may have used some of her course books I don't know she took the resource and um, changed it into a full-on lesson plan which she taught with her students and then shared on the website so there's this kind of it's constantly growing and building and it's it's personal contributions from all kinds of people okay so uh, this was a cause in Spain which became immensely popular and won a European award for sustainability um, it started as a two-person uh, a pipe dream over a cup of coffee and turned into a massive beach cleaning operation across the north coast of Spain. Uh, so it's a, a fantastic success story. Uh, here are some of the figures. And so uh, 5.7 tons of waste were collected. 10,000 students took part. So that was two people over a cup of coffee. Uh, so it's amazing what we can do um, just from uh, the, like the acorn of an idea. And um, also then as a follow-up from the language of the sea, there was a language of the trees. So I think this is very similar to the um, Operation Oak uh, that you're going to be hearing about later. Okay, so victories. Um, so uh, we also kind of wander outside the world of ELT and share uh, stories of hope. So um, stories that can be taken into the classroom that can be shared as well, that could just be a quick lesson. So replacing lawns with bee friendly wildflowers, for example, or um, stop, um, in Australia to stop logging trees so that the wildlife can be safer after the terrible fires. Okay. Um, this is from um, a local school again in Spain, and how they were bringing together ecology and peace. So here we have the peace sign um, that's been built with plants. And that's just part of one of these whole school approaches that we've been talking about already, that um, it's just becomes part of how the school works. And recently, um, I read an article from a school in the Basque country in the north of Spain which very simply explained how their day-to-day -day greening of the school works. So um, how they have recycling mascots uh, that have names and have become kind of the school pets. So they're just puppets, but these puppets are responsible for the recycling stations. They work together with the local um, a health center to recycle masks, which I must admit that when I read about it, it was the first time I'd heard because masks have become such um, 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 the, the new plastic bottle in a way. They're everywhere. And at the school, they have a bin where the masks are collected and then they're taken to the health center and the health center recycles the materials from the masks. Um, the, the children have together uh, made from um, recycled materials, um, a bread bag that they use to bring their snack in for mid-morning. Uh, they have a menu, so everybody has the same food. Uh, so, but the yogurt is brought in in glass pots and then shared out to the children who bring in their containers, which is the, each, they have their name painted on it and how it's all become just part of, they make their own things. Everybody makes the same. 
and um, they have a garden. It's a, it's a it's a city school, but they have a little garden, they keep hens, and this is just part and parcel of the working of the school. So again, these are the kind of things that, um, the stories that we love to spread. Um, so uh, coming to the end of um, my presentation, and then we can have um, a more open conversation, but um, here is a woman who inspires great hope. And um, we were talking about eco-anxiety earlier, and I think that um, everyone agrees that one of the most important tools for combating eco-anxiety is to teach with and to teach for hope. Um, and so I, I really love this particular um, motivational poster and uh, um, so that hope is something that you create with actions and so this the the actions are the important thing this is what inspires us being able to do something and in doing something then that gives us energy and i love this idea of it can be contagious so um like i think um the graham you were talking about the again the um oak project and how this this was totally uh, contagious for you that it was like you know you thought you were a non-plant person and then suddenly you're dedicating time energy and passion um and so uh, it is this the power of contagion um uh, the power of enthusiasm okay so this is um and one uh, post I want to share you share another one with you. I don't think that any uh, presentation on um, teaching for the climate emergency should not include. Oh, sorry, I'll come back to her. A word from um, Greta Thunberg, and here we go. That um, the whole idea of the importance of the individual. So, with knowing that change has to come through, has to be systemic, but individuals can make a difference. And um, I was at a conference um, last year online, which uh, the Innovate conference again, where the, um, the climate emergency declaration was made. And people were using um, bamboo toothbrushes almost as a kind of an insult. They were saying, oh, well, yeah, you can use your bamboo toothbrush, but that's not going to save the planet. And there's this idea that I think that you know it's not one action but that the people who do take actions the people who care the people who are pressurizing the people who are going to make change they also live an individual lifestyle which is coherent with the change that they're asking for so yes the fact that you don't use a plastic bottle that you don't use a plastic toothbrush that you um, cycle instead of using your car and you do this consciously it means sorry it means that um, you you are going to be the kind of person who's going to be building change so the individual actions are important because they're part of an ind a profile of a person who is going to take responsibility okay I'm going to flick back um, I jumped over this one. I love this idea of the accidental activist. Um, this is a TED talk, and it's about a mother who um, discovered through, I think it was through her child, um, getting some kind of a, uh, a cough, a chest infection, about the pollution that was being created by um, a local um, plant. And she took on the problem on her own initially um, and then actually created a whole movement uh, that managed to bring about change but um, she started she started just with one small action and then that kind of snowballed so think small not big is a ted talk that i highly recommend if you enjoy watching ted talks and she's an inspirational person someone who would not have thought of herself as an activist at all, who fell into being an activist, but then got swept up by the this contagion of, of hope and of being able to do something. OK, so we'll flick on. Um, oh, this. Yes, this is what I wanted to show you. OK. Um, 
I don't know if there's anybody here who took part in the ELT Footprints community survey. Is there anyone here who's a member of the ELT Footprints? Militza, I think you are. Yeah. Yeah. Ja and I think great. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, 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 this was this was some time ago. It was like last June. Um, I, I think. Had a look, and I found I joined in May. May. Whenever the, the when did you start? Twenty two thousand nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> So, um, so last June, we launched um, a survey uh, of ELT Footprint members and um, asking about uh, teaching practices, um, addressing environmental issues in the classroom. And we got, um, we got responses in the hundreds, which was great, from a, a range of different countries. Uh, Brent was one of the people that we interviewed as well for the survey. Thank you very much for um, that contribution. And um, here is one of the questions that was asked. Um, so what do you hope to achieve? Okay, and um, these were the typical questions. These are individual answers, but very typical of the kind of answers that we were getting. So this, there are, it, it proved that a lot of teachers out there, okay, they're members of the LT Footprint community, so obviously they're already interested, but this is what they want to do, to um, give students tools to feel that they can take part in this discourse community. But also, I like this, uh, foster a genuine respect and insight, encourage awareness and positive action, and not only among the students, but other staff. So this idea again of the third level, that it's kind of, it's not, education isn't only influencing the students, it's also the whole of the school and from the school, the community. So the families, the parents as well, this, this idea. So this is what people want to be able to do. But then also we wanted to find out what the problems might be. And so these were some of the fears that teachers have And I think this is one of the things that ELT Footprint can help with, is to help people to um, set goals, to take the first steps, to choose relevant lesson material, to choose different approaches, to hear lots of different voices. So um, from, you know, so, so Melissa, your voice is so powerful and useful for preschool teachers. I've never taught preschool kids that's not my um expertise at all i'm a teacher of teenagers older teenagers so it's kind of a completely completely different approach so um how do we address it what do we do how do we so the, these are the questions that can be asked in the elt footprint community and you will get answers that's the beauty of it because there are people who are experts in all the various different contexts okay so we have looked at these things so far and now i just want to extend an invitation to anyone who isn't already a member to come and join us um, here is all of the information that you need so the website um, which i will just type into the chat now Okay, uh, so the website, but you can follow us on Twitter using uh, at ELT Footprint or the ELT Footprint hashtag, um, or you can join the Facebook group. The Facebook group is a private group, which means that um, you need to request to join, but then one of the um, admin there's, we've got an ever-growing <laughs> uh, group of members who are um, who are basically accepting the invitation. So you make a request, and then you will get accepted. Um, and um, that's it, really, from the presentation. I'm going to um, close. Well, hold on. I think do I have some references to share with you? Or no? There we go. Okay. So. I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see more faces. And um, if, does anybody have any any questions, comments? 
It'd be um, interesting to see your hands up. Who is a member? Hamida, yes, yes. Hamida is an active member as well. Okay, yeah. So, um, hi, footprinters. <laughs> um, Catherine, yes. Uh, a member is a very loose um, term because basically uh, there isn't a membership as such. You know, you don't have to do anything other than join the group. Um, but you can also be an ELC footprinter without joining the group because you could be following on Twitter. Uh, you could be following on LinkedIn. Um, the idea really, who, who's a member? Anybody who's interested <laughs> is a member, basically. Any other questions or comments? I have a technical question. Um, yeah. Can you read? Can you read the chat box? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question in the chat box, or are you going to put it in the chat box? <laughs> it's already there. <laughs> it's already there. Ah, sorry. Then I shall. Do I need to scroll up? Okay. Is it the? Has the LT footprint changed its name? Um, you may have seen ELT Footprint UK. I think that there's so there's um, there's an organisation which is UK based and very active. Um, uh, it, it's headed by Chris Etchells um, and his team, who before ELT before ELT Footprint existed on Facebook, they had a Yahoo group which was for UK schools. Uh, they're incredibly active within um, the UK context. It makes a lot of sense to be running things on a local level because obviously the global ELT footprint community, we tend to talk a lot more about um, our kind of context. So teaching English in a non-English speaking country. So teaching English as a foreign language, but the uh, ELT footprint UK is addressing the issues of teaching English um, in the UK specifically. So some of the issues, some of the issues are exactly the same. Most of the issues are exactly the same, but a lot of the kind of day-to-day um, -day management issues or the whole idea of students coming from abroad and all of these issues are, are different. And so they address them specifically. Um, it's a it, it's a great organization to follow. They're very active. They also um, have online events, and um, Chris is amazing. He's an inspiration. He he's a powerhouse. I don't know where. I think he probably doesn't sleep. <laughs> he does so much. Any other questions that I've missed in the chat? Okay. Um, oh, green action. Okay, hold on. Melitz, I'm just catching up with your... That's something I haven't heard about. Oh, no, it isn't. It's ELT Footprint UK. It's ELT Footprint UK. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They've changed their name. And I, I wasn't aware of the name change. So thank you. Now I'm aware of the name change. Maybe they changed their name because they were getting confused with us. <laughs> but we're cousins or sisters. I'm not sure which. <laughs> okay. Um, right, can I, can I ask, answer any more questions or does anybody want to just um, join in? Ah, okay, so the question of relevance. Milica, what what um, what's your feeling about it? Are you you're muted, Milica? You're muted. 
just wanted to write, I, I don't want to interrupt you. One of our colleagues that works with the vein in Neil, the sustainable van, he has a great catchphrase. I think yeah. all of us have each own catchphrase, which is great. Yeah. So uh, a vein's catchphrase is uh, something like, um, don't be the polar bear teacher. Uh, which is, ah. which is uh, yeah, that, that's what Ben says. Mine Lovely. is don't teach the nature without nature. So I think yes. that's, okay. that sums it up. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the, this question, so um, uh, Milica's uh, in the chat is, is asking about the idea of relevance. And I think a lot of teachers who maybe haven't started addressing environmental issues yet or aren't um, active in doing so, it's one of their worries. And um, so I think there's kind of like it's it's there are two answers to this that I'd like to give. One, first of all, is we, we've been talking about this a lot is local, make it local, local connections, um, local actions, uh, the local context is definitely the easiest way to make anything relevant, right? You know, sort of whatever we're teaching, we make it relevant by making connections to the students' lives and um, their local context. So the environmental issues, all the more so. Uh, <clears throat> unless you live where there are polar bears, polar bears aren't relevant, you know, but if you do, if you, if you live in Canada, and uh, the polar bears are in, uh, uh, ransacking the trash, then it's very relevant. Mm. Um, but, but then the other argument which I use for skeptics um, or people who say, I'm a, I'm a language teacher, why should I be teaching this? Um, we go back to uh, the idea that this is the defining issue at the moment. And um, therefore, if you don't know the language of the discourse around this issue, uh, then you are deficient um, as a language user because mm. this and and more and more and this is just because this this is the global situation um, and exams are slow to change but they are changing and I did a survey um, or a really quick and superficial survey but basically I was looking for questions on um, the that kind of the global exams you know so like uh, Cambridge Trinity um, to see how many questions there were that uh, touched on environmental issues. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very easy to find them. So I could find examples in all of the Cambridge uh, lower and upper suite exams just by looking through the latest exams. Somewhere um, in the speaking exam, in the reading exam, in the writing exam, it's there everywhere. So even if you're a teacher who doesn't feel that you should be teaching these issues, you should be teaching the language because if not, you are shortchanging your students because this is something that they need to be able to understand the language of and use the language of. So at least that would be a, a starting point for um, anyone who's feeling skeptical about the relevance to students. It can actually, you can show students that it is immensely relevant and that it's just in the same way that they wouldn't they wouldn't not teach the language of technology for example you know you you oh no sorry i'm not going to teach you how to talk about technology in english it's not relevant like it's relevant of course it is uh, and so the same thing um with the environment another question okay um yes and i think the thing is that the Publishers are following the exams in, and also taking this on board. But I think another thing that's happening with the publishers is that there is also um, a pressure to not be the polar bear course book, uh, as it were, and to um, integrate the subject um, rather than think of it as one more subject or even one more unit in the course book. Uh, but to see it as something that runs through everything. And this is kind of like um, a lot of materials writers are taking this on board or pushing this. Um, and again, I like I, I make the analogy with technology. So uh, as a course book writer myself, if I was writing a course book 10 to 15 years ago, um, there would have been a technology unit. And that technology unit would probably have taught future verbs. Okay, and we would have had like 
the usual flying cars and stuff, but also things that computers can do <laughs> would have been in the future. So then we moved on and the technology unit became the unit about the past because we realized that there's no way that the books were going to be able to keep up with the future of technology it would be the past by the time the books reach the students. So, um, so then it was looking back at technology. But now what's happened is that technology is in every single unit. You talk about shopping, we talk about online shopping. Um, you talk about, um, I don't know, uh, travel, um, you talk about apps, hotel apps or whatever. So it's the same with the environment. You talk about um, clothes, you talk about the carbon footprint of clothes, um, or even the social footprint of clothes opening out into the bigger kind of, you know, sort of social issues. Um, we were talking about the SDGs, you know, it's the same thing that it's not just the environment, it's the way that everything is interlinked. So that this in whatever the topic is that you're discuss you're discussing, or you're teaching, there is an environmental twist, um, or an environmental angle or environmental issue or actually the environment is central to the topic but it isn't a unit where you see the polar bears and then you read a very dry um, text about something that the students have no interest in that's not what addressing environmental issues in the classroom should be and I think that this change is slowly taking place but it's not going to take place overnight Um, just catching up with the chat. Okay. Um, I think that the, what you're saying, Brent, about um, Greta and other activists, and, um, you know, I think the issue, the issue is one of the media having got hold of Greta as the flagship activist and she's done really really well to spread the message but she herself tries as much as she can mm. to bring other activists into mm. um you know sort of into the spotlight and it's not her fault by any means at all oh, absolutely <laughs> and yeah. so, um and she's doing everything she can but I think in a way thank god she exists because mm. she was part of that 2019 surge of interest she was very much um a kind of for good or for bad but the media figure that that helped in a way heighten the awareness and the horrible abuse she gets is yes appalling, isn't it it's disgusting yes. really yeah but, um yeah you know. so um please let me know if i'm missing anything else from the chat i'm scrolling up but i might well be missing mess messages that Okay, so yeah, um, he's saying yes. Is it uh, Melissa still? Yeah, that that some some high school students hadn't even heard of her, and yeah, um, a friend and I we went and did a presentation to a local school as well, kind of with this idea of you know sort of have you seen this girl? Have you seen what she's doing? And and lots of lots of the students did know her already, and a lot of them didn't had never heard of her. So yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, any, any other comments or? Yes, Glenn. Sorry. Um, I've been using uh, reading materials for students, but I've only found um, sources in America. Mm -hmm. I haven't found really um, news articles or small articles um, from other countries. What kind of places, I mean, do you know any kind of places that I could look at? I've looked at the British Council, this kind of thing, and there's lesson plans, but what I'm looking for is, you know, the small ideas that people are doing in other countries to introduce to students as part of reading activities. Well, I would, put that question on the ELT footprint group and you will get That's what I was uh, <laughs> a whole range of different answers. Um, and but in general, I, mean, I think I think each of us lives within our within mm. a different reading bubble, mm. as it were. So I don't know why, but for some reason I get a lot of Australian texts and <laughs> <laughs> kind of pop up on my news feed. And um, 
I guess also like on Twitter, if you follow um, activists and activist teachers from different countries, then you'll see stories from them as well coming through. I think the thing is to try and use the network of teachers that exists right. to, to, to widen our own scope, as it were. And we don't have to go looking on our own. The thing is that it's, it is easier, yeah. quicker, more efficient to ask the question. And you'll definitely find someone who's really keen to answer it because uh, people want to help. Teachers want to help. Yeah. You know, sort of, teachers want to answer questions. If a question is asked, then, then you know, sort of, we want to find an answer. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll do that later. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, uh, we've got to 6.30. So yep. if I can just say, um, uh, we should give you a round of applause for such a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And um, we're going to take a short, is that right, Brent? We're going to take yeah, a short, take a break, short break for, 15 for about minutes. 15 minutes um, and then come back. Um, and we're going to have three breakout rooms with different presentations. So it's 6.30 now and we'll recommence at 6.45. So let's all take a break and thank you once again, Gary. Okay, I'll stop the recording now.